I prepared this title thinking um, to a microbiology audience, but I, then I thought I would give you a bit broader background on the things that I do, just to give you a little bit of frame on the, on the whole uh, picture. We, we look at endophytes. Endophytes are a microorganism that whose, whose habitat is the plant's inside. It's called the endosphere of the plant to oppose it as opposed to the phylosphere, okay, which is the surface of the plant. Uh, so why are they interesting? Endophytes are, are symbionts of the plant, so they have somehow evolved the ability to live with the plant, within the plant. So they might be, you know, associated to the plant to different degrees. We, uh, there's not a general rule of thumb to decide whether they are uh, beneficial, they just live in the plant, they happen to be here, how long they're gonna be there for, and um, what we know for sure is that we, that we call endophytes though that those that are harmless to the plant, so they do not cause disease, which is already something, <laughs> because most people tend to think as plant-associated microorganisms as those that cause harm to the plant, that they are pathogenic. We are only recently come to terms with the fact that there's a lot of microbes that live in plants, as they do with any other higher organism, and they just don't cause a disease in themselves. Now, there's a lot of discussion on what disease is. I'm not going to go into this, but we are, we are now used to the fact that, as Vittorio was saying, we, we live with a very complex uh, community of microbes in, in our gut, and every animal does, and fungi do, and algae do, you know? Pretty much every higher organism, any multicellular organism harbors microbes inside or within its tissues. But the same way we, are, we have come to terms with the fact that we have a lot of microbes in our, in our guts, uh, expands to the plant. Plants have a lot of microbes that live not only in their gut, which is obviously their root system, but also within their tissues. Okay, and we have discover, well, we have, be, we have known this for quite a while, but it has, it, it's now that we are coming to, to understand what is the, the, the function of this, what's the meaning of having so many microorganisms. We started to think that there is no such thing as a sterile plant. Okay, but what we like it, them for is that because microorganisms can confer traits to a plant, it's a very interesting thing when you think how troublesome it is for us you know, to, to modify a plant. When you want to confer a trait to the plant, you either, you either have to genetically modify it, which is not accepted for us Europeans, or you have to find out a way to confer the trait. But what happens if we manage to confer a trait, adding a microorganism that can already naturally colonize the plant? That's, this is the, the concept that, that's behind something that was defined as a symbi symbiotically modified organism, SMO. No, it's a, it's a, it's a different road that takes to the same place and uh, with no transgene. Anyway, as I was saying before, there are different degrees of association and uh, there are different ways that association uh, affect the plant. No, that there's... Um, Plants that help the plant, my, sorry, microorganisms that help the plant growing uh, by fixing nitrogen, solubilizing phosphate. There are organisms that enter the, the tissues and they just live there. They don't seem to do anything else. And when the plant is sick, then they become, uh, you know, they feed on the dying tissues. Uh, they are opportunistic, which enters and leave the plant uh, without uh, the plant taking too much notice. There are obligate endophytes, microorganisms that cannot live anywhere but the plant tissues. And what we normally call endosymbionts, which are the, 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 the organelles, which are, were probably uh, very likely uh, archaea a long time ago, that, uh, or um, generally speaking, uh, bacteria that have become so tightly associated to the plant that they are part of, they are considered plants, but they were originally bacteria, more very like. Uh, there is a, a wealth of, of evidence that there are 
all kind of microorganisms living in the plant. There are eukaryote microorganisms such as fungi, there are archaea, there are bacteria, and they do a lot of things. Like we, we are interested in mostly a few things. We like them because they can help us manage disease in a more sustainable way by controlling plant pathogens. Uh, this is one example from uh, a number of plays that we have of general antagonism. It's very, very common to see this. You know, if you isolate a few microorganisms, they obviously defend their, their, their space and, uh, and they will fight off each other. And sometimes they fight off the, the plant pathogens. Uh, and they sometimes also help the plant, the plant growth by not only by solubilizing or uh, fixing uh, nutrients, but sometimes producing uh, plant hormones directly. The one that you see red there is a, it's a, it's one of the ones that we were screening with, which really highly produced in the acetic acid. Uh, so what, what we can do, for one thing, when we find out that there's an interesting candidate, it's to start understanding its ecology. So why, why, why are we interested in, in the ecology of bees? I mean, it's, it's, it's fun to study the ecology of microorganisms, but what, what, why is it also interesting for the others? Uh, it's because when we know the ecology of microorganisms, we can also use them at best. So imagine you have a microorganism that will make your plants grow higher, produce better. You don't need to dig in rock, rock phosphate, which is a, a, you know, it's not a non-renewable source and it's gonna end up someday soon, someone says. Uh, but because some microorganisms in the soil can solubilize inorganic phosphate. It's nice, but how do you do it? You just spray it in the field? You know, producing a microorganism is quite expensive. If you have to spray it on large amount of fields, it's, it's a lot of money. But if you know how the ecology of the microorganism, if you know something about its ecology, you might know how it enters the plant, how it, it makes it. it. Does it colonize the seeds? Or it more likely colonize the worms of the plant or the roots? Or is it transported by insects? When you know that, when you know this insight, when you know what, what makes it a good or a bad colonizer, then you can use it. Or you can decide whether you want to use it, that or, or another one. So that's why we want to know more about this microorganism. It's not that we just need to find out that they are good at producing endolacetic acid. We also need to know that they are good at colonizing, that we can easily put them in a product that, that companies want to use that makes a difference for them. So, well, what, one thing you can do is to use a, a marker gene, which is, can be GFP or can be uh, a different marker, <laughs> to, to, to look where they are, to look at what they are doing, what, look in the plant what's happening around their, their colonization. Someone says infection. I don't like infection because it makes me think of pathogenesis. Uh, we're also looking at what what microorganisms are, are transferred between insects that live on plants and the plant. If you take a sterile plant and put a, an insect on the plant, you'll be surprised to the amount of endophytes that the plant has in a matter of two weeks. I'm talking 10, 20, 50 species that are carried. Also, there's a funny thing, this, uh, endophytes, I mean, we, we always think of them as uh, as beneficial or uh, at the worst case scenario, they are harmless, you know? But bacteria are bacteria, you know? They, in, in great numbers, you know, there's a, there's a uh, LMD also for E. coli. If you get a brick, or one kilo of E. coli here, <laughs> it'll probably hurt you. So when we give the microorganisms to the plant, there's also a dose dependent or a time dependent effect that, we, that we, we see, like microorganisms which are very beneficial to the plant and improve its growth might become harmful when you, when you overexpose the plant to them. In this case, it's a, it's a very small plant, so it's very sensitive to the this dose dependent, actually I think it's an exposure dependent effect here. So the plant that, was, that died was exposed for more than half an hour to a high concentration of bacterial cells. These bacterial cells in small numbers you will see that improve plant growth quite clearly in, in grapevine. Uh, but this is not just growth in terms of amount of biomass that they will 
stimulate, can, uh, the effect can be on, on the number of seeds that germinate. Let's, let's put a, a, a seed, a general seed, in, in, a, in a poor soil. Not all seed will, will become plants because the poor soil can be very bad for the, for the seeds to germinate. But the right end of it might actually increase, I think here is fivefold in the best case, the number of seeds that germinate. So this could be also a way to solve problems of soil exhaustion. Or exhaustion. Yeah? Soil exhaustion is a big problem today for agricultural soils. So I hope I'm starting to get you interested on, on endophytes and what they can do for us. Uh, so what we do is, uh, besides studying their ecology, we also try to look at what traits regulate or are responsible for this ecology. And this is a tricky <coughs> business for those who have tried and who have attempted into this, because when you have a, a genome, there's a, there's a number of traits that can come out and a number of traits that can be uh, crucial, but also you have, in front of you, you have thousands of genes, no? And you have to <laughs> try to understand which, which matter and which are just. Uh, and uh, also, uh, you know, there, there are limits to genomics so that you will, when you have a, a set of uh, contexts, it's not always like what, what I see here. I think I have a pointer. Uh, if you look at this, like, this is a, an alignment of three reference genomes, known genomes curated in the literature. And our genome, which is obviously not there, uh, because it's, it's the one, basically, this is how they compare to our genome, no? In this case, I think it's an Ervinia, although we would not, were not able to ascend it to the species level. And what the analysis tell us is there are large insertion in our Ervinia, okay? So if there's an endophytic Ervinia, which works well, well on the plant and has large insertion as compared to the sequence Ervinias. You see here these gaps? These are insertions in our strain. Wow, that's interesting. So there's a lot of other genes that you don't normally find in Ervinia, which our strain has. What are they? <laughs> well, it turns out that our tools, bioinformatic tools, to predict, for example, phage insertion. And a few of these insertions are possibly phages that have, in the course of evolution, become part of the genome. Some other parts, you will see it quite clearly here, this black line is the GC content of that specific region. It's very likely that when you see one of these insertion, which is the empty box in the known genomes, there is a sudden change in GC content. So is this real? Is this an artifact of the assembly? Is it a plasmid that was mistakenly <laughs> assigned to the genome? We're still looking at this is a work in progress. I'm just trying to give you an idea of the complications of, of this comparative genomics approach. But there are a, a number of signatures. You know, this, this could be a, 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 an island, a set of genes that is easily transferred horizontally across microorganisms. Microorganisms do that a lot. I, 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 uh, I understand that this is not a microbiology uh, audience, so this might become new to some. But microorganisms are, are very promiscuous. They ch exchange a lot of DNA also with very distantly related microorganisms. There are universal mechanisms of DNA transfer, and they don't mind to accept transfer from very, from very uh, strange contributors. So this might be pathogenicity, uh, not pathogenicity, but uh, genetic islands, or they just, just might just be plasmids. It's not easy with the tools that have, also the bioinformatics have access to, to tell apart a plasmid from the chromosome. You can do it, but it's tricky. <laughs> and, uh, but there's a lot to work when you have, well, this is a starting point, in fact, to uh, starting to analyze what, what, what's hidden in, in these genomes. No? So that's another thing that we are doing now with our strains, that one that we got to, to cultivate. But another thing is you don't get to cultivate many of them. So when you look at what you can culture from a crushed piece of surface sterilized plant is not what you see when you sequence the, the bacterial sequences within them, which is another problem because this is obviously common to the soil environment, it's common to the gut, human gut or whatever environment, you will be able to grow on a plate a fraction. It varies quite a lot, 
one in a thousand, one in a hundred, one in ten, if you're very lucky. But most of them, they will not grow in standard lab conditions. So we started to also sequence the, the 16S gene, which is the equivalent of the 18S in eukaryotes, to see how diverse it is in, in bacterial communities. So bacterial work, bacteria work as communities in the, in the plant, as well as they do in humans. Uh, but this community actually change. They change as a response to stimuli, which are mostly environmental stimuli. Now, when your environment is a living creature, your environment changes quite a lot. And, and we don't know how much the outside environment affects the inside of the environment, which is the plant, and how much both of them contribute to the fluctuations of the, of the microbial community. But to understand how the community fluctuates also helps us to, to understand we, how microorganisms, the, the ones that we apply, for example, in agriculture, which is the thing that I'm interested in, you know, how stable they are, how, how they impact the microbial community that normally lives in the plant. Can I spray 10 to the sixth microbes on a plant? Will it do something to its community? Is it helping it? Is it harming it more than it helps? What's the way for me to do this? So there's a, there's a concept in microbial ecology which is arising in these years, which is the, core, the concept of core microbiome. Core microbiome is that part of the microbiome which is stable. It's always there. And there's a satellite microbiome, a variable one, which is subject to environmental changes. Now, I think most of it is satellite <laughs> microbiome. There's very few things that you will always find in those numbers. The large part is the satellite microbiome, or at least this is my own experience, then it might change. But uh, there are papers that work that deal with humans, no? like what happens when you give an antibiotic to a person, you know? There will be a bump in its microbiome. Bacteria mostly will, you know, will <laughs> have to be reestablished after that. So it's, it's tricky. It's a tricky concept, but it's very interesting to, to, to think of it in, in this way. That there's something that's always there and something that circles around it. Uh, because we think in taxonomic terms, you know, we say, okay, Pseudomonas is always there. But Pseudomonas is doing something. We, we should start to think in functional terms. Ecology itself. It's a functional uh, uh, discipline. When we look at a microenvironment, a wood, you know, that this bird comes and uh, colonizes the, and puts a nest on the trees. But what it does is what it matters. You know, it pollinates something. It's not the, the, the identity of the bird, but it's the, the function that it has in the environment. Same thing is with the bacteria. We're still not doing it properly. Mostly with these bacteria that live in plants because they pose a, a few extra problems. So what we are interested in is in understanding grapevine microbiome, because we like grapevine. We have grapevines and wine in uh, Trentino, as well as apples. I'm interested in grapevine, but uh, I will also work on apples sometime soon. So environment. How does the environment affect these communities? Climate. What happens when the climate is different? Seasons. Seasons affect both the plant metabolism and the microbiome. How are the two effects linked? The genome of the plant are, are different varieties selecting different microbiomes. What is the proportion of the satellite microbiome that's affected by this? And uh, the health of the plant is a healthy plant, the same as a, as a diseased plant. Uh, what happens when we cultivate plants? You know, plants are not living in, the, in their wild environment. Plants are living in a field where we put them in lines. We take away the, the, the grass in between the plants. It's a very artificial, human-made made up environment. So all these things we are interested in understanding. <laughs> and so this is the, what's in a few grapevines that we, where, where we sequenced a half of the 16S gene, okay? So this is what comes out from the diversity. So you can see that the, <laughs> this is what I, I meant when I told you, you know, the satellite microbiome is the most of it because they change quite a lot. Every color is a different genus. So within every color, there's diversity. And every histogram is a sample, it's a plant. Okay? This is taken from a specific part of the plants, which is the leaves, and uh, the inside of the leaves, so after surface sterilization and uh, removal of the outer surface. 
and uh, they change a lot. Do you agree? When I saw this, I said, okay, there's no core microbiome. <laughs> This is, yeah. PCR, 16S, so all the bacteria there, yes. and you sequence everything. Right? And you sequence everything, all the 16S. So you have a photograph of the bacterial community in that place. Exactly. This is grapevine, okay? So this is a, actually there's two sets that have been put together. First one, maybe, maybe point it out, it's nicer. <laughs> From here to here, it's called AEM, and the other one is called timing, okay? So there are two sets which have been slammed together. But I was happy to see some similarities. Now, every color represents a taxon, which is most, it's very likely to be a genus because we have long sequences that are helpful when you wanted to assign it to a, to a taxon. Okay? And this was a nice one. This one has had a good diversity that, that correlates with what we think drives diversity. So we were lucky here. And we think this is a good set, we can publish it, okay? <laughs> but it's not always like that. Sometimes you have the diversity, which you can't explain. When you can't explain the diversity, it's, it's tricky <laughs> because you don't know what's driving it. But what, what, what that is translated into is a, a, a multivariate analysis. So you make a multidimensional space and then you try to maximize it visually, okay? So if you look at this, this explains the diversity that we saw before, okay? So for example, the sampling time is the variables by which they are colored here. Can you notice this are the same as this, only colored differently? So here we have the, the samples from October are in green and they cluster in this area, this area, and here, okay? But it's, it's, a, it's a wide area, isn't it? These samples are from June, okay? And the ones down here are mostly July and August. But when we colored them according to their health status, some plants were diseased and some plants were healthy and some plants have recovered from disease, you will find that the plants, like the, the plants in October, so the green plants that are diseased or recovered from disease are all here. They are in red and orange. And the healthy ones are all here. Okay, and funnily enough, the healthy plants are close to the plants that were sampled in June. Now this specific disease is absent from the plants in June because it hides in the roots and it then comes out again in summer, in spring, actually not late, late, late spring and summer. So in June, the disease is still in the plants but it's not in the organs we are sampling. And the plants in June, both the diseased one and the healthy one, they all cluster with the healthy plants in October when the disease is out. So this is a good result. <laughs> we like this because it, you can explain it. But it's not always like this, okay? And it takes a lot, a lot of effort and expertise to analyze this data. It's, I mean, it, it, <laughs> it has to be done by someone who is specifically trained for quite some time to analyze community diversity. And it's not trivial, I assure you. It's a lot of complicated bioinformatics work that you can't do on Windows. <laughs> it's not common. This is just to tell you, you know, how sometimes the ecology of these communities is not straightforward. You have to, so this is how we, we did it. But so you, you take the, the sequence, uh, we, we sequence a part that starts here at the 800 base pair of the 16S and goes all the way to 1500, okay? Then you put it in this machine and the machine gets out you know, a million sequences and then you have to <laughs> look into them to trace. But what we found was a very, now I'm going to the, the topic of this talk, which is one very specific bacterium, which we found by, by really by accident. So I told you, you know, you don't cultivate a lot of these bacteria. So I thought, what happens if we take them and cultivate in absence of oxygen? Like in the plant, there's not that much oxygen when you go into the tissues, is it? I mean, the tissues, yeah, there must be a little bit of oxygen, but not a whole lot. I mean, they're not in contact with the surface of the plant. So there's little oxygen. What, what happens if I take the, the tissue, I grind them, 
and then I do this in a CO2 environment, you know, oxygen-free environment. So we did this, and we got a few colonies, not that many as I hoped, but they said, okay, let's, let's identify them. So we, we amplified the 16S, just the standard Sanger sequencing, and then we found out it's a very unusual thing. That's something that was told me, uh, this is Propionibacterium acnes. And I thought, okay, you've touched the plates. <laughs> the, the, the guy that did the experiment said, no, you don't have to touch the place. You know, it's very <laughs> you have to be more careful because this lives on the skin. And how do I know this? As every scientist to say, I went to Wikipedia and I looked it up because <laughs> as a plant microbiologist, I had no idea what P. acnes was. <laughs> so I found out that P. acnes lives on the skin and when you're a teenager, it clogs your pores and feeds off the fat that your skin does and, uh, and gives you zits, you know, the pimples that you get when you're in that age. <laughs> Uh, so this, this bacterium that we found in plants, supposedly, is, is this human skin bacterium. It lives on humans because humans make so much fat on their skin. It doesn't live on any, on, on any other animal skin except, I think, guinea pig, which, is a, which has a sebaceous gland in its back. So it lives on human, mostly. Human skin, human gut sometimes. And that's it. Oh, so we, we must have touched the plates. That's what I thought. You know, I th everyone would have thought, you know, there is a contamination from the person that did it in the lab. But let's go back one. And then, you know, just to make sure, I, I looked again at the sequencing data, you know, the 16S sequencing data, and there were quite a lot of propionibacteria there. We can't say, at the first glance, I couldn't say if they were acnes, but there were a lot of propionibacteria. So I thought, hmm. Maybe he hasn't touched the plates. And we took a few representative sequences and blasted them. And it turns out they were P. acnes in the plant. So this is starting to be interesting now. The other thing I haven't told you is before we did this PCR, we physically remove with clean gloves and a sterilized scalpel the surface of the plant. So the surface of the plant is removed before the PCR. So it's very unlikely that we have contaminated them. But I looked into, into our samples. We have hundreds of plant samples sequenced, whose community was sequenced, and it was in most of them. Now it becomes really interesting because it might look like this human skin bacterium lives inside the plant. So it's really weird if you think about it. This is, you know, this is how it clogs the pores and uh, you get the uh, seeds on your skin. So how, did it get, how does this get into the grapevine? Really? So obviously, I, I told you it wasn't a contamination. We thought, we started to think, I was always very dubious. You know, I'm spending time and money on something that will turn out to be a contamination. And uh, yet, it started to be convincing when we found it so consistently in the sequencing. And so we, what we did was, again, take this DNAs obtained from plant endosphere, so after removing the surface, and looking for three genes that in the literature for this microorganism were taxonomically relevant. 16S, easy. We have a lot of 16S sequencing from our uh, pyro sequencing approach. Then we need RecA. RecA is a, it's a very interesting gene. It's a gene that's everywhere in the microbial world because it's a recombinase that's, that the bacteria use to fix their DNA. So when the DNA has some problems, it, it recombines wrongly, it, there's base, RecA fixes it. It's there in all bacteria. It's so important because every bacteria needs it to live. That, like, non-functioning RecA means the bacterium cannot repair its own DNA. And TLY, which is a th toxin, I think, but it's important in this genus. The other thing we did eventually was that we wanted to really make sure that the bacterium was there, so we did a fish analysis. We, we built a probe for this species, and we looked inside the bacteria where our hands could not reach, so it's confocal laser scanning micro, uh, microscopy, where it, you know, it goes it into the tissues optically, so you cannot touch and contaminate that. <laughs> There's no way. And so these are the results. 16X was used. RecA, as I told you, is essential for DNA repair. It's very conserved. It's, it's a taxonomically relevant gene in, in most species. And there are three, 
for groups in, in Piaknes population that these genes are used to tell apart, and TLY is the third gene. So we found Propionibacterium acnes in about seven, a bit less than 7,000 sequences spread around our samples, okay? So we identified them, and uh, these are representative sequences. So where I write P acnes, they are P acnes, okay? These are from our sequencing. And this is a fish analysis. So this is a general, so what you see in green I put this just to give you an idea of how many bacteria live inside the, the grapevine tissues. Every little green dot is a bacterium. I mean, the, the grapevine is really, literally full of them. Okay. A part of it, let's say 0.5% to 1% is P. Acnes in our analysis. But look at, I mean, I think this is par parenchyma. Okay, and this is, this is the xylem of the plant. And now here, the white or blue dots are piacnes by fish. So we could see them literally in the place where we could not reach with our hands. This is proof that it lives in the plant. And, the, and we started to be thrilled about this because this is an animal microorganism, microorganism that lives inside the plant. There's one more thing. This little picture here is a bit interesting, more than the others, because this is pith cells. The pith is the white part that is at the center of a branch in a plant. It's a spongy tissue. And there are not so many bacteria in the pith. Most bacteria are in the parenchyma, on the, on the surf, near the surface, or in the xylem. But the pith does not have that many. And we find this in the pith Apparently, so this is optical microscopy, and it's not that good for this purpose, but apparently inside the cells. So what this picture is telling us is that the green fluorescence is in the cells, not between one, you know, in the tissues, but in between the cells, in the cells. To live in intracellularly requires a high degree of symbiosis. To, to adapt to live inside, inside cells is not the same as living in the tissues between, between cells. Can you see it, actually? It shows a bit differently here, but I think it's still visible, isn't it? So the other thing that we noticed when we, uh, we sequenced the RecA gene, so we took the whole DNA of the plant, we, we, we did a PCR on RecA gene, and we, we, we did some cloning with this fragment and then sequencing. Now, this picture shows on this side of the picture, the blue side of the picture, let's say, has the, the rec A genes in literature. You will see a, a bigger dot where there's a, a mutation or a, or a residue that's different from the one that is present in the others. So, for example, all these residues are conserved, and this is a variable residue, okay? So these are the, plants, the ones that we got from the plant. There's a very different scenario here. We got mutations everywhere. Stop codons, nonsense, changes of amino acid as frequent. So the ratio between mutation that caused the change in the amino acid to the rate of mutation that were silent was one. There is no selection anymore. This means that this gene is lost. It's not functioning. Rec A in P. acnes in the plant is dead. The, 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 the bacterium is not repairing its DNA anymore. So, okay, I said, have you used the proofreading? Tuck. So we did this again. <laughs> and then I called the sequencing service. Did you have any problem in, that, in this batch of sequencing? It was not possible. Come on. And then everything. We did it again, and it turned out the same. Actually, this is a, a mixture of two experiments, just to show you that it's exactly the same in both. We did it with the proofreading uh, enzyme again. So it must have been the tuck was, you know, someone left it out of the fridge. It didn't work. No. That worked. Worked, worked perfectly. The, um, the enzyme, is, its function is lost. Rec A, which is this universal enzyme that every bacteria has because they need it, it's lost. So how is this happening? When you make a, a, a phylogenetic tree, this is what happens. So this is the tree that we generated using the, the TLY gene, which is conserved. It's nice. And this is the comb shape 
of uh, the phylogenetic tree that you get when you analyze REC A. It looks like, boom, they are <laughs> diverging. There's very long uh, branches. This is not like, you don't find this in the literature very often. So we were scared, thrilled. We were thinking we were doing something really wrong that would come out in the end and kick us in the, <laughs> in the back. But then we found literature. So there's safety in literature. <laughs> so we find out that there is one situation where REC-A can be lost. And this is when the initial stage of genome degeneration associated with the establishment of endocellular symbiosis. So when a new endocellular symbiosis starts, the genome needs to be arranged. There are large chunks that are lost. And this is very often associated with loss of REC-A function because REC-A function fixes this problems with the DNA. And so, and so it, it can't be lost. But the, the bacterium needs to shed its DNA to get rid of parts that it doesn't need, need anymore because it can use the, the plant's metabolisms to feed some parts. And so REC-A becomes a burden. It, it tries to fix things that must not be fixed. And this, and this is the only case that I could find in the literature where REC-A is lost. And I thought, this is a nice story. <laughs> this fits very well for, with the observations you know, of the endocellular habit in the in the pith cells. And there's uh, two more. There's very few, like there's uh, just a handful of papers where they describe rec -A loss. Really, you don't see it. It's, it's an essential gene. Mm. But then, you know, we also have the nice 16S spider sequencing data. So what the rec -A data tells us is that there is loss of function and all these, you know, are scattered across different groups, but when we look at 16X data, where the mutations are not so spread, it looks like the red ones, which are the plant ones, they're all together. It's like a subgroup. It's like a subspecies or a species, I don't know. It's always tricky, you know, you have bacteria to, to tell what's the species. The, but you remember that in the beginning, I isolated some bacteria. So when I sequenced the RecA of those two, they had perfectly functioning RecA. Their RecA is perfect. The only RecA that's, that's not working is the ones that don't grow on the plate. So my idea is that they, when they lose RecA, they became obligate symbionts. They will not grow on a plate anymore. They don't like the, the, the lab environment. They want to stay in the plant. They need the plant for, for feeding, you know, probably some basic metabolism that they've lost. So <laughs> quite clearly, this story about 16S is telling us that this is a group on its own. Now, you can do one, one nice thing when you have a gene that's being lost. Because when you ha don't have any more evolutionary pressure, to, it's called a purifying selection by a phylogenist. You know? Something that kills the, the, the wrong version of the gene is purifying selection. When you don't have any more, you can make a molecular clock. And you can date the moment when that gene has started to mutate. So you can see, sorry, uh, that our, the, the blue ones are the ones that we could cultivate, and they are not in this group. They have perfectly normal 60s. They have perfectly normal uh, REC A, no mutations. This is why we couldn't do the genome, because they don't grow on plate. You have to do another thing. But then we did this uh, molecular clock, and it was interesting, because the molecular clock, which is usually made to date you know, millions of years, said 7,000 years. 7,000 years is 5,000 before Christ. It's about when we started agriculture. We started agriculture probably a little bit earlier, but this might be when we started touching the, the grapevines. I mean, if you think about it, the, the earliest grapevines must have been cut because grapevine is a very nice plant. You can cut, make a cutting, put it in the soil, it will make roots and, and leaves. It's perfect for agriculture because you don't, have, you, know, you don't need to harvest the seeds, keep them dry during the, the wrong season. You take a piece, put it in the soil, it comes out. So people will touch it, cut it, touch it a lot. You have to prune it, one season to the other. So you, there's a lot of contact with the skin. And so this, this, this molecular clock it says 7,000. It's, it's a very rough estimate, I have to tell you. Like the people that did the idea in this estimate, there's a molecular phylogenist that they did this, and he said, okay, we have to be very careful. It's plus or minus 2,000 years, which is a lot. <laughs> but still, like, it's very, there's a very good coincidence with human activity. It's not telling us, you know, 
500,000 years ago. It's telling us something that's really when we think we have started a human activity on grapevines. OK, so <laughs> let's go to the next one. Well, the next one is, uh, is a confirmation of this. So we did the same clock on 16S, although you cannot be, it's not as good because 16S has purifying selection. It's a gene that's useful. So, you know. But this also tells us 5,000 years, this number here. OK? So 5,000, 7,000. It's a good, I mean, if you think about how shaky this is, this is a good estimate. It's a good, it's a good coincidence, no? So we were really happy also about the dating of this to be, to be probably coincident with human activity. So we might have been the ones that passed this to the grapevines. And so we gave it a name. And uh, it worked. <laughs> and also because DAP obviously is a tool for agriculture. This is an agricultural environment. So we thought it was acceptable. And uh, it worked. These are the people that worked on it. Omar Rotastabelli made all the trees. Lino Metto made a lot of the evolutionary analysis. Livio did a lot of the sequencing analysis. Uh, Michael did the work in the lab, and Stefan and did the fish study. Uh, I just put together the pieces, <laughs> and this is it. Now he works in Haiti. <laughs> yes. <laughs>